This conference okay. will now be recorded. So topic for today is Git. And because this session is like regarding the second the coding interview or the DevOps interview. Sorry, I don't know why I'm saying all this coding interview, but it's DevOps interview. And honestly, uh, based on my like 16 years of experience, I rarely got any question related to the Git. So unless or until you guys specifically applying for a position where it involved like a CI CD or a Jenkins pipeline where they, the team is specifically using a Git as a platform, uh, I want to learn based on you, your guys' experience, like what type of question you see doing the, as a part of an interview. Okay, so I will always pause for a few minutes here and there and just want to uh, ask you guys like, what type of question you expect you as a part of an interview. In the meanwhile, I try to do my research in the last week. I try to grab, like pass all the web, uh, all the different websites. And unfortunately, the level of question which is present on those websites, and even there are some uh, YouTube channels where they are mentioning like uh, 50 top uh, interview questions, all those, those are like a kind of a pretty bad. So I'm not expecting those kind of a question to be asked as a part of an interview, but I will try my best, whatever I uh, find it out in as a part of this, I will share it with you guys. Okay. So coming back uh, later to this version control system, uh, my experience with the version control system is like, uh, it started with a CVS, uh, which was a kind of a bad, I can say at the current stage, because for CVS, the biggest issue was that, you know, anyone who has experienced with CVS, if anybody checked in the file or if anybody locks the file, and if you forget to unlock the file, you need to call that guy or you need to ping that guy to unlock that file. Uh, SVN, then I started using, means as a part of a different assignment, I started using SVN. And it was a kind of a okay, but branching and all those things, which is pretty bad as compared to, uh, to Git. Uh, the third is like Git. So I started using Git in like close to like 2011 or 12 when I have been asked like to uh, find out a patch for a particular bug in the core utils version. And I still remember the first command that I've used is called a Git clone, which I think most of you guys who are using Git are aware of that. And the second command was like Git log. And currently from last four years, I'm uh, leading a team who have, we have a big Git deployment, which is called a GitHub Enterprise. And that uh, internal web, uh, that internal version control system is handling like a 10,000 per user. And it is a, like a huge transaction rate of like one GB of data per second going in and out. And 10,000 are the actual users. Then we have a infinite number. I can say infinite number of bot users. So I have some experience with Git. I cannot say I'm exporting Git, but I know a little bit about Git. Except for that, in some of my consulting experience, we have migrated some of the repos from SVN to Git, as well as from GitHub to internal Git. So if you want, if you guys want to talk about all those things, how to scale Git and all those things, we can definitely discuss about it. But that's not the part of that's the part of the today presentation. But I'm I'm more than happy to talk about all those things. Okay. So this is a little bit about like my experience. So let's, without wasting your time, let's get started with the Git. So first thing is like, uh, I have a lot of things which I need to cover in this next one and a half hour. So first thing I want to start with a poll. I want every one of you guys who can participate in this poll so that I don't waste your time. Uh, can you guys just participate in this poll so that I will skip few of the points. If, for example, if most of you guys have already have experience with it, I can skip some of those things which I want to discuss it with you guys, so that we will be able to finish this webinar like in one and a half hour. So I will pause for a few seconds, at least for thirty seconds. I just can everyone participate in that poll.
think we have more than 50 60 people but so far i'm seeing like eight polls uh seema can you click on the button in the front of it like three two one okay but anyway got it okay guys i think most of you are intermediate or we have a mixed split of like 50 50 beginners and intermediate okay so let's get started okay so like this uh on the feedback that I have received from the last time, I am going to do it based on like, I am going to present you a scenario, and then based on the scenario or based on the interview question, we are trying to find it out like what exactly is needed from the gate end. So first thing, uh, we all know what is gate, right? Or at least we have an idea. It's called a DVCS. Okay, and it's called a distributed, distributed version control system, right? Uh, anyone can pitch in and tell me like what exactly is the DVCS? Or you can answer your reply in that Slack channel. Uh, like uh, initially we used to have SVN where the repository was uh, on a single server. Now uh, with distributed version control system, everybody clones the repository on their particular system, make their changes and then push to the central system. So everybody has a copy of repository, so it's distributed. Yes, exactly. And the main advantage of using a Git over SVN is that in case of a SVN, you not always need an internet connectivity. Okay, so basically if you have this SVN server, okay, and this is your local workstation, so you always need a connectivity. Let me see the other way. You always need to clone that repo, or in a case of a SVN terminology called a checkout, you always need to check out this repo to your local workstation. So if you want to make any changes, you always need a connectivity between the SVN server and your workstation. With connectivity, I mean the network connectivity. But in case of a Git, we have a three-stage thinking. Uh, we are going to discuss what are those three stage thinkings, but for the time being, think of it like with, between a Git and right now I'm talking about Git. I'm not talking about GitHub. For GitHub, you definitely need our internet connectivity, but I'm just talking about in terms of Git and between your workstation, you can do your all your work or all your coding or whatever you are doing in that Git repository without even connecting to the internet. Just end so. Okay, so don't worry if you do not understand these terms, we are going to discuss about all these things. So first thing is, uh, my first question for you guys is like, how to create your first repo? And we are going to see it both in terms of GitHub as well as Git, but what is the command to create a, your repo? And once again, I'm saying in terms of Git, not GitHub. Uh, get in it. Get in it. Yep, exactly. So the first command we need to run is called get in it, and I can give it a name. For example, my first, let's say my first, and then I am going to go inside this. Prashant, actually, your screen is freezing. Freezing. So now we are able to see the screen. Yes, yes, now I can see. Sorry. No, no, sorry about that. I know it's a weird internet. So let me go back here. I run that command called git in it, and then I can give it a name. For example, my first repo. Okay. And then I go inside that, uh, that directory which has been created. And you will see a directory which is created inside it called dot git, which is a create directory. Okay. So last 15 minutes of this session, like from 9:50 to 9:30, I'm specifically going to go uh, to discuss about git under the hood, like how this object uh, works, this specifically this particular directory called object. And if we have a time, we can discuss about all the other things like config and branches. Branches we are going to discuss it here. So. Go 
don't want to confuse you guys. This time, just try to understand. To create your first repo, we need to use git init. Okay. I go inside this repo, and inside this repo is created a directory called dot. Prashant Prakash here. Is this the first repo is in in the in the current your laptop, right? It's not Saro. Yes, it's just my current laptop. So I'm okay. going to show you guys how how to do it in the GitHub. But let's first focus on the on or as a, on the Git part. Okay. So I created my first repo. Okay. The second command to see like. What exactly inside this repo is called git state? Okay, this is the first time we are going to see the output like this, where it says we are on the branch master. If you do not understand that part, I think most of you guys who, are, who have an intermediate knowledge on git, you understand this part. But don't worry about it. No commit yet, and nothing to commit. Okay, at this point of time, I will tell you guys do this. And this is just based on my experience. Git supports something called aliasing. Okay, so for example, you know this command in Linux, ls-l, right? Or ls-l, I can go to any directory, slash cmd. I can create an alias, let's say, whatever it is, right? ls-l. So rather than typing ls-l every time, now I can type L and slash TMP. The same way, in case of Git, I can create this alias, which I have posted where I have posted here. So let me copy this. So what exactly we are doing at the global level? I'm going to discuss about what is exactly this global level. There are actually three levels: global, local, and uh, system. I'm creating an alias that next time I don't need to run status command. Next time, if I'm going to run the status command, I already set this alias. I just need to run git sp. Okay. And hyphen s is for silent mode. We are going to discuss about this. For the time being, just don't worry. Just set this alias. And from now onward, rather than typing the git status command, for all the future commands, we are just going to run this sp as an alias. There is one more alias. Just set this up. I use this alias heavily. Uh, I'm not expecting you guys to understand this alias at this moment of time. But anyone who have experience with Git, you guys understand this alias. Okay. So, do anyone wants to talk about this alias? Or do anyone understand what this alias is doing? Prashant, your screen is frozen, I believe, on Git ST. Okay, actually, I no, no, you uh, paste. I post, post, yeah, I posted on Slack channel. Okay, actually, we haven't discussed about all these things. So just uh, set this alias, and we are going to discuss what exactly this is doing. Okay. So for now onwards, uh, for all the log-based things, we are going to use LG. And I'm going to discuss what exactly this. This is actually makes sense for you guys when we start talking about the branch. Okay. So coming back to after setting up the alias, and just last thing. If you want to see where exactly this alias will set up, you need to use git config hyphen l. And you will see that this is the place where it is exactly being set up. Okay, and there's a configuration file for this. Okay. Uh, I, I know we digress from the main thing, but let's come back to the git stuff. We have created a git repository. Let's create our first file. And let's say my file name is first file. Now, if you run that git st command, you will see something different. And that's what I told you guys. If you go back here, we set up the alias using something called status hyphen s, where s stands for silent. 
So sometimes, or most of the time, at least for me, uh, this whole big stuff does not make sense. So that's why I always run my git status command in the silent mode, where it just show me the content where that is. Okay. And right now the question mark, question mark in front of this file is like, it have no idea what we are doing. So what exactly we need to do? We need to tell Git about this file. And the way we are going to do it is with the help of command called Git add. Okay. Now, if you run that ST alias, which you have set it up earlier, you will see that that file is added to something called a staging area. Okay. Let's not worry about the staging area for just one second. And the next command, I need to check in this file to my git repo, adding first file let's say. And if now you run the git status command, you will see that everything is clean. Okay. So let's go one step back and we will see what exactly happened behind the scene. Okay. And to do that, let me post you one link and then we will go step by step. But any questions so far, or just give me one minute, I'm going to show you what exactly happened right now. And I know it's too basic for a few people, but I want to get this clear. So I posted a link on the Slack channel. This one. Okay. So if you go here, this is the diagram I want to highlight it at this stage. So we have something called a working directory. Okay. And working directory is this temp my first repo where we have created our repo. Uh, and then we run a command called add to put that file into something called a staging area. Okay. Now think of staging area is like a shopping basket. That's the simplest way to put it, to put it out. So for example, if you are doing some shopping on, on Amazon, okay, and let's say I want to buy some of the Python books. So I put first Python book in that shopping cart, and then I will find out some other Python book. I put that book in a shopping cart. So before doing a final checkout, I have an option that I can remove that book. From, like Let's say I put like two or three books in the shopping cart, and then I realize, okay, this first and the third book, it almost almost have the same content. So I can, I can go with the first book, but I'm going to remove the third book. So similar to that, in a case of a Git world, that is called staging area. And we haven't talked about something called a, a remote repository, which is a GitHub, where we are going to do a final push, just to make sure that all of our changes are there safe. So before pushing to the GitHub or any other solution, for example, GitLab or a Bitbucket, we have an option to remove our content before the final checkout in terms of Amazon analog. So that is the use of a staging area. So what we did here, we add that file to make Git aware of that file with the help of add command. And then we had perform a command called git commit to commit that file to our staging area. Okay. And now the second alias which we have created for example, forget about that alias at the time to check what exactly we have done. We have a command called git log. And this git log command is going to throw us a big SHA-1 hash, which is a 40 character log. Okay. And it is saying, okay, this is having, uh, this is currently pointing to a master, which is a default branch. Uh, don't worry about the branch right now. It is created by this guy whose name is this. Its email ID is this and at a date, and this is the commit message that we have added at the time of committing this file. Okay. And if you remember, we have created this alias called git lg. So if you look at, if you want to get a concise version of that, we will see with the help of this lg input. Okay. So I will pause for 30 seconds. Any questions so far? Hey, Prashant. So once you put it in the staging area, so that's that's when. Uh, so right now, when you commit it, that's when it's in the staging area, right? Or, or it's it's already mm -hmm. past the staging area. No, it's it's in staging area right now. Once you commit it, okay. 
So if you want to move back from stage into working area, how can you move this first file? Like if you want to revert back. Yeah, so for that, we have a bunch of command um, that, that I'm going to discuss later. That's called reset command. And there are three type, type of reset called talk, R, and list. So okay. just give me a few minutes. We are going to discuss all those things. Okay, thank you. Any other question? So Prashant, so whatever the file you created in your local folder, now it, when you run this command, it goes to staging table. That's what it is, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Before moving further, any other question related to this? Because now we so, have created this file. Yeah. Prashant, yeah, I have a question ahead. about the uh, alias. So it is, mm -hmm. uh, the, this one I'm seeing for the first time. So is it like just to make uh, the life easy for us? Like instead of uh, get log, we can just write get uh, LG and that can pull out the logs information. That's what, right? Or, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Alias is just to make your life easy, nothing else. And I, I'm using these two alias heavily. And honestly, these, these alias are not created by me. I, Google it and find out all these areas. So I'm using it from like, for example, last five or six years. Sure. Yeah, Prashant, it's, if, you, if you do git add, git add is going to put it in the staging area. Otherwise, git commit is going to put it in the staging area. Because in the diagram, uh -huh. if you go through the diagram, if you commit will go to the git directory repository, that is not a staging. So that means if the staging area means if you add it to, if we add that shopping cart, whatever it may be, that is going to be the staging area, right? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, git add is going to add that file to the staging area. Git commit is going to put into the local git repository. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. And then there's one point which is missing. It's called a remote repository, which we are going to see it now, where most of the people we are doing it, right? Like most of our, we as a developer or DevOps engineer, we used to put that file into a GitHub. So that we are going to see it now. Any other question? Yeah, sorry for the confusion, guys. So, so Prashant, when you say Git repository, that is in your local lap, current laptop, right? It's not going to yeah. server. Yeah, exactly. So that's what we are going to see it now. Okay. So whenever you push it, it staging area is something different. Then after that, when you commit, it is committed into your local for local for repository right local laptop repository yes 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 so but when it goes to uh, the the main server where everybody can see your changes that is later right yeah that we are going to see it right now okay but before doing that you need to set up something and that what let me post in the slack channel So before we are going to discuss about the remote people, I know this creates some confusion, but you need to set up two more variables. And that is called, uh, I'm not sharing my screen, but I'm posting that in the Slack channel, just to avoid any confusion. It's called user.name and user.email. You need to set it up. Now I will pause for a few seconds because I see in one of the thread or while do, performing a Google search, that there's few people who ask this question in the interview. What is the use of setting up this user.name and user.email for your get config? I will pause for 30 seconds and wait for you guys to answer this question. Exactly. So basically the correct term for this, or I mean the politically correct term for this called credit of your work. So Git will know who actually performed those commits. It should need to know something called a username, which you can set it up anything. And same thing is called user email. Okay. Uh, most of the corporate environment, you have something called SAML enabled, or you have some kind of a SSO, or you have some kind of a, kind of a LDAP particular in front of Git. So that we will exactly know who is committing those changes. But on the open source world, you must at least need to do these two changes before pushing your commit to Git or GitHub. Okay. 
So just to avoid any, any more confusion, let's create our first repo, and then we will see how this will come into picture. So to create a new repo in Git, either you can go here and go create new repo. Okay. I will say my, any, you can give any name, my demo repo. Okay. Uh, I will leave the description for a time being because our main focus is to, sh to show you guys what is this repo is all about. I mean, how to create a repo. Uh, there's two things called public and private. I'm, I want to keep this repo as public. Okay. Uh, I'm not initializing any readme file at this stage. I'm going to show you what exactly is this and what is readme.md, which is a markdown language. And there's something called git ignore. We are going to discuss heavily about this. What is the use of the git ignore file? Okay. For a time being, don't worry about it. Just do something called create repository. And this is how we can create our first repository, Git repository. Okay. And this is a remote one. Okay. Now there are two ways. First thing, if I need to bring that changes into my local desktop, I have a two ways. Either I can do HTTPS or SSH to bring that change into my local desktop. So what I can do, I can do this. And let me open a new terminal. And the command I need to run to bring that changes is called git close sign. And the name of the repo. Git clone and whatever link I have copied. So it will say it's clone my demo repo. You appear to have cloned this demo. My demo. Okay. The other thing which we have discussed so far, the repo which we have created with the name of this my first test repo, if I need to push that changes back to GitHub, okay, let's say this is the project issue which I was working, I created this. Most of the cases, or almost in every cases, you want to create the, this repo as the same name as what you have you are creating locally, okay. But I think we have, I have done a mistake, but. Let's say this is a project with which you are working and your Git administrator, he has created this repo for you. Now you need to push your changes, whatever the code you have wrote so far into the GitHub. Okay. So the way you can do it is something called remote add origin. Let's copy this and then we are going to discuss what exactly this is doing. Let's copy this. Okay. This guy. And then I will push it. Just give me one minute, I am going to discuss these two commands. First thing Git is going to ask me if I am doing a clone or I am adding an origin via the HTTPS with a username. So let me try and correct this guy. Password. Now if you refresh this page, you will see the, the first file which we have created is now pushed to the GitHub. Okay. One thing is like, if you see here, we have basically given our username and a password at this stage. What will be the case if we don't want to use a username and a password? Then that case, in the clone, I need to set, set it up something called a SSH. And the way to do that is, I need to generate a new SHP, for example. I want to generate a new SHP. Uh, let's say, well, let's say SHP gen. Om Prashant SH. And we will say, okay, demo. Okay. And now I need to copy the public part of the key back to Git. Copy this key. Anyway, I'm going to delete this key after this demo, so I'm not worried to showing it up here. What exactly you need to do is you need to go to the setting. Okay. Uh, go to SSH and GPG key. New SSH key. Okay. Yeah. My demo SSH key. And you can edit. Okay. 
So now the advantage of this is next time, for example, we created this my demo repo. I can go to clone here. I can go to SSH. Uh, let's look for the new location. Go here. This is the file, first file. Okay. Let me make some changes to this file. Let's say echo, hello, and first file. Okay. Now, again, you need to run something called git status. Here you can see that the, the status of file is M. M is modified. Okay. Now, to see those changes, like what exactly the change you have done is a command called git diff. Git diff will tell you that what whatever we save on git versus whatever the difference which you have done on your local staging page. So this is the difference, right? You have I have added this file. I have added this uh, entry in this file. Okay. Now again, we need to follow the same pattern. Hit first file. And if I run the git ft command again, I will see that this file is not turned into read, which means it's a part of our staging data. Now a question for you guys, or it might be an interview question. If I run the git diff command again, will I will be able to see those changes? Yes. And why? Uh, because uh, there will be different version uh, for the the file which we modified recently. So every time a new version will be getting created, and if we are doing git diff, it will be comparing from the older to the newer version. Yeah, partially right, but okay. So because this file is in the staging area, so you are correct. But if I exactly want to see this, I need to run something called git icon in stage. Now you will see the changes which happens in your staging area. Okay. Now, just to make this situation a little bit complicated, we know we have modified this file, we have added this file, we have put this file to a staging area. If you do, guys forget about what is staging area, this is a staging data. Where we have just added the file, we haven't committed it. Okay. Uh, just to make the situation complicated, let's say I open this file plus file. Uh, and let me let me make some more changes to this file. Now you will see a a completely different git status. So you will see M and M, which will say, oh, this file is modified in the staging area, and whatever we have, oh, in my working directory, sorry, and the staging area is M. Now again, the question back to you guys. If I run the git diff here, what exactly I'm going to see? Is I'm going to see the changes of this hello? Is I'm going to see the hello? Or if I'm going to see the test which I have done it here? You guys got the question, right? So I made the situation a little bit embarrassing that I have the file which is present in my staging area. And even the file is present in my staging area, I created some commit. I have made a, not a commit, I made a modification to that file. So if I'm going to run the git diff, what changes I'm going to see it now? Sir, but this, this change is not pushed to staging area. You made changes to only to the file, but it's not pushed to staging area. Yes, yeah. so that's what I want to hurt. So if I am going to run the git diff, I will see only the test, right? And again, if I'm going to run the staged, I'm only going to see a hello. So now one more question for you guys. If I want to see both of these changes, I want to see the changes which is done on my staging area as well as on, on my working directory. Sorry, vice versa. How can I do how can I see both of these changes?
new one. I need to see both of these changes in my staging area as well as the working that stage. You have to push it to staging, right? Then you can see here there both same. Yeah, that I can do it, but any other way I can I want to see both of these changes without even pushing it. So the way to do it is something called a head. We haven't discussed about the head so far, but head is the way you can see both of these changes. The changes which is done, head means the top of your branch head. So it is going to see the changes which is not even committed and which is present in your stage. Okay. Just remember this. Don't worry about it. We are going to discuss all this head and master. So now coming back to the same point. So if you remember this time, we have done something called a SH clone, right? To bring those changes. Now to see that what is our remote repository, there's a command called remote hyphen B. Okay. This is going to tell us where exactly is our endpoint. Endpoint means the GitHub endpoint. We haven't discussed about the fetch and push, so let's not worry about it and why we have these two endpoints, fetch versus push. I think most of you guys who are like having already have a knowledge of it, you understand the difference between a fetch and a push. But let's not worry about it. So now I have the file in my staging area as well as in my commit area, which is having in my, sorry, I don't know why I'm saying commit area, in my working taxi as well as my staging area. So I will do the same thing get add okay here i am using dot which is a wildcard which is going to include both of these with any file in that directory so be careful while using the wildcard because in this case i only have a one file so that's why i'm using a wildcard if i do st then it will say okay now that m that one is gone i only have the one modified file and i will do adding first file Adding first modify. Okay. Last time, if you remember, when we pushed that file, where that change has gone, we need to pass the username and a password somewhere here, right? Not clone. So I have lost that screen. But if you remember, I need to you gave my username and a password at this point. Because this time we have performed something called a clone via SH and we already transferred our keys to the GitHub. Let's try to push the changes. Okay. This time we don't need to pass a username and a password. And this is what most of the companies do. They have set up a SH key. At least what I am doing in my case that I have a SH key set up between my Jenkins machine or any CI CD system to the GitHub or our local Git repository. And Git repository or Jenkins, while performing a webhook, is trying to pull all those changes whenever the, anyone committing a push to the GitHub. So I don't need to manually pass a username and a password to my, uh, to the, to Jenkins. So Prashant, mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. So if we have like test, say 10 developers in the working in the same repository, so then for SSH uh, passing to the to the remote repos and they then they don't they need to have the key for all the 10 developers, right? 10 different laptops, right? For pushing it through SSH. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we need to add 10. Then we need to add 10. Yeah, go ahead. So as, as a developer, you only need to set up your keys one. Oh, on, on his so, account, okay. On his account. This is account basis, this is not a repo basis. So once you set it up, and if you if I'm in future, if I'm going to use this laptop as my development machine, I don't need to set up keys again and again. So just just uh, one okay. Type okay, not the repo one. Okay. Sure. Just put not on. the repo one. Okay. Okay. Any other question later to this? If that part is clear, then we are going to discuss the most important things with Git, which is called branches. Okay. 
and I am not going to discuss about like what type, what will be your branching strategy because that is a, like a wide topic. And I know it depends upon from company to company. But one thing I will recommend you guys to go through it is something called, let me bring this. Please go through this video whenever you guys got a chance. This is called a workflow strategy. Like different companies have a different way. Okay. So for example, all the companies or all, if you go back to the screen, you will see something called a branch called master. Right. And this is the default branch created in Git or in GitHub when you created a repo. So, so far we are working on this repo. And if we go, if we run this command, we will see our default branch, which is called master, which has been created. Okay. Now, what exactly is this branch? So branch is nothing, but it just represents an independent line of development. Okay. Let me write this. Branch is nothing, but it's just an independent line of development. What exactly does this mean? So for example, I have this master branch and I'm not seeing all the cases, but whatever I have seen in last like eight to nine years when I'm using this is most of the people or most of the company, they're using this as their broad branches. It might be different, but I'm just saying based on my experience. And then they create something called a feature branch. For example, this is a branch which nobody's going to touch it, this master branch. And then they create a feature branch where all the new development is happening. Okay. This can be feature branch one, two, three, whatever it is going to be. And then there's something called a bug fix or so if something happens, if there's some bug happens to your code, they are going to uh, have a separate line of development called a bug fix branch. And once they have fixed the bug, they will patch it either using this branch or merge that code back to the master. So that depends upon company to company and that's a wide discussion topic. So whenever you guys get a chance, just watch this video that I posted in the Slack channel. It's like a six or seven minute video. It explains really, it, the explanation is pretty good, like how to have your branching strategy. But if you are planning to set up a Git in your local environment or in your company uh, development environment, Please spend some time uh, to to think about the branching strategy. It's really critical. Okay. And again, feature branch, I'm just giving you an example. You can put any branch name, for example, a development branch, anything. That's what I'm saying. It's a big topic. We, I can go about it. They, I, means I can spend hours and hours just to discuss about this topic. So it depends upon company to company whatever you want to call it. You don't, if you don't want master to be your main branch, we can change it. I'm going to show you how to change a default branch from master to some other branch. Okay. So with that said, let's create our first branch locally, and then I will show you how to create it on the data. So we are here and I show, I told you, we can see a branch here like called master. Okay. And if you run a command called branch hyphen A, you will see something different called remote origin head and remote origin master. We are going to discuss all these things, what, what is actually the use of that. Okay. And if you want to see what is exactly your remote, sorry, hyphen B, you will see what is the remote branch, which in this case is our github.com, my username, and the branch name. Let's try to create branch locally. I'm just showing you just for the purpose of this demo. In most of the cases with what I have seen so far, most of the developers or whoever, whoever be the org owner of that particular branch, they used to create these things in the GitHub console. So let's try to create it locally. And then I will go to show you how to do it in the GitHub console. So to create a branch, you just need to run a command called git branch. Uh, my first branch is a creative name, right? So git branch. 
And if I now run the command called git branch, you will see that I've created a separate branch called my first branch. So most of the time, I always need to be on master. Most of the time, again, I'm saying. So what exactly is going to do? If I need to go to that branch, I need to do something called git checkout. So if you are coming from the SVN world, SVN has a different meaning of checkout, but in a Git world, that means you are going to that particular branch. So now I am switched to that my branch. So if you remember that I we started with the master branch, and then I created this branch called my first branch, and then I performed the checkout. There's a shortcut for doing that, but let's stick to the basic right now. And because I cut this branch. Okay, so we have a master branch at the top, and then I have created a branch from this from this master branch. I have this file which is present on the master branch. So again, I'm saying most of the time we try to perform a cutover from the master branch so that we have a stable line of code. Because I said master is my pre pre branch where I have the stable code. So if I'm going to cut any branch out of it, I will always try to perform. I am again saying it's a best practice, but it's based on company to company. I always try to cut that branch from the master. So that's why what I have done here, I created a branch from master, my first branch. Now you will see the advantage of the of the this LG alias which you have created. You will see that okay. Uh, one second, Let's check out master. So now you will see that right now we have our head on the master, but we have created my first friend. Let me try to perform some commits so that you will see exactly what's going on behind the scene. So git branch, again, if I need to do some work, my first branch. Okay, now I am on the my first branch. Let me create a file called my first branch. I don't know why I'm coming up with all this creative name today. I do the git add, which we are doing it so far. And, and same way, you don't need to type all these commands. You can create an alias for this. Okay, adding my first branch file. Okay, now if you run git lg, you will see that the head is on the first branch and you have created this file called my first branch. Okay. Two things I want to emphasize here, which I am not doing it. First thing is your git commit is atomic. Okay. I again pause for two seconds. Anyone know what exactly this means atomic in terms of git? Come on, guys, it's only 850. I think the commits have to match between the remote and the local, maybe? Uh, actually, no. OK. OK. So let's say, so far, we are dealing only with one file, right? Let's say I created a file called 1.txt, 2.txt, means whatever. You got the picture, right? And number of files. Like, let's say I have 100 files, uh, which I want to commit and push back to the GitHub. While performing the push, Okay, let's say at this point number two in the file, two.txt, uh, let's say I have some kind of a network disrupt happen. There's a breakage in the network connection or the network is gone in my area. Git is going to roll back and going to not going to commit this whole three files. Okay. So let me explain it to you guys in terms of this one.txt, two.txt, and three.txt. Let's say I'm adding all these three files as a part of a commit. And then I say that this method, adding three files, one, two, three. Okay. And then I'm pushing this file. And I said that while pushing this changes, one is being one is being in the process of push. And at the time of pushing this file, 
there is a network disrupt. So Git try to maintain the integrity of it. So it is not going to push even a single file, one dot .p. Remember this point, Git commit is always atomic. Either it's going to push all the three files or it's not going to push any of these files. Just to maintain the revision consistency. Okay. And second is more of a, like a, a best practice. You, like your commit message should tell the story. I know I'm not doing it as a part of a demo, but I know in my companies or wherever I've done the consultancy, people are very, very focused in terms of what exactly you are writing in terms of your commit message. The commit message should tell the story of your commit. It can clearly tell that what exactly your commit is doing. I know few people who are going to reject your pull request if your commit message is not proper. So try to give a good commit message to tell like, okay, not say that well, I'm, I'm adding a first file. I'm committing the first file. What exactly inside that first file? So this is just a best practice, but follow that best practice. Okay. So now coming back to this, we have created this first branch, right? And we have added the file to the first branch. Now I'm in the first branch, okay? And I have this file called my first branch file. Now let me try to do a checkout to the master. Now I am in the master branch. Okay. How many of you think that the file that I have created on the other branch, my first branch is present in the master branch? Is it present or it, it should not be, it should not be present here? It should not be present. It should it not be. be present. Yeah, we have to move the file to this. And that is what the main purpose of what we are talking about this branching strategy. That we should have a different branch which is independent of each other. We are the independent line of development. And once we are done with our changes, we are going to do something called, uh, in terms of which it's called merge. Which is exactly what you are saying. We are moving that file, or not exactly are moving that file, we are copying that file from this branch to this. And the way to do that is called git merge. And then I need to give the branch name. I'm just showing you this with the help of here, but most of the time this is going to do with the help of the UI. Now, if you check here, we have that file called a my first branch. Okay. Few things to notice about this is like if you see here, this is saying something called a fast forward merge. So in case of Git, there are two kinds of a merge. One is called a fast forward merge and one is called a recursive merge. Okay, we are going to discuss both those two kinds of a merge, but let me first try to uh, do, or let me first try to show you with the help of a UI how to do, perform a merge with the help of a UI. So let me push these changes back to GitHub. Okay, so whatever changes we have done, I'm just pushing it back to the GitHub. And what's the name of the branch? Got my first branch. Okay. And by default, the branch is master or region. If you need to push a changes to the my first branch, you need to do something called. And that I'm going to show you right now. What is the difference between git push versus hyphen git push you origin of uh, my first branch? Here you are specifying your branch name. And if you see here in GitHub, now it's saying that it created a new branch called my first branch. Okay. Let's pause here for a few seconds and let's see with the help of a UI. So you will see that I have both of these files present on the master branch. And now I have one more branch called my first branch, which has the same commit. Okay. And if you go here, you will see that now I have two branches where the master is my default branch and I have a my first branch, okay? Now, again, going back to the same thing, which I will, I'm again emphasizing, it depends upon company to company. So if you go here in something called setting for that particular branch and you need to be a branch admin or the org admin to perform these actions, go to branches and here you can update your branch. So for example, I don't want 
master always to be my default branch. So again, it comes back to the same diagram. It all depends upon your environment. You don't want master to be your default branch. Okay, you can change it over here. You want your feature branch to be your default branch. That is that is where the whole the cutover happens and the changes put uh, push to your production. You can do that. Okay, so there are ways to change it, but again, it's based on your personal preference or whatever be your company guideline. Okay. Now coming back here. Now let me go back to something called my first branch, and whatever we have done here, like we have performed a something called uh, we have created our new file, and then we have merged it to the master. Let's try to perform the same thing with the help of a UI. So I'm not going to create a new file. Let me go to this file, my first branch file which I have created. I can do something called this button called edit. Uh, let me do modifying this file. Modifying this file. And the same thing which we are doing, like for example, add and committing, this UI will take care of it. Okay. So in my first branch, the file that I've created, I'm right now, I'm inside the my first branch. I'm modifying this file. This is a commit message. And here you can see that GitHub gives me the extra option that I, either I can commit these changes directly to my first branch file, or I can create a new branch. For the time being, let's create a, let's commit these changes to the, this my first branch. So now I have committed these changes. Go back to the repo. So now you will see that the, this my first branch is ahead of my master repo. That the changes which I have done here, if I go back to the my first master branch, right now I'm in the master branch. This file is empty, my first branch file, which I have just modified. It. So in most of the cases, this is what we used to do to merge those changes back to the master. We have created something called a pull request. Okay, and I'm going to show. I'm showing you just a oversimplified version of that. In most of the company environment. Whenever you are going to do a pull request, it will go through your CI CD system, uh, do a bunch of unit tests behind the scene to see if, if you will be able to merge those changes from your my first branch to the master. Okay. Same thing happens here. Like for example, if you have a feature branch and you want to merge that code to the master, it's going to run a bunch of those uh, unit tests or tests which you have defined and you they will see that if that code will be merged to your master or not. Okay, I can give any message over here. Most of the time, I what I used to do, I used to tag a team so that they can verify those changes. Okay, so I can, can give a name of that other other team member. For example, I can give the name of the other guy. This is my own ID, but I can give the name of the other team member so that they will be notified. Okay, there's a, one new pull request which is being built. So I'm right now I'm not doing it, and I can do something called a create pull request. So now I have this pull request and because I'm the admin of this branch and I'm doing all these things, the way to merge those changes is something called a merge pull request. And I can say confirm merge. And now those changes are merged back to my master branch. And I, all, all, I have an option either to delete that branch or I have the option to, to uh, we got that change also. Okay. Is that part is clear? Uh, Prashant, uh, mm -hmm. so in real uh, environment, only the um, owner can do it, right? The organization owner or the or the or the repo admin can only merge it, right? Exactly. Okay. Not everyone can merge. Okay. Not everyone can merge. Definitely means we don't want to give everyone a, 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 a right to merge those changes because it can break my master branch. So those who will be having access to the particular repository or uh, those who have written the code and checked in, they should be able to merge it with the master. Or, and that's what, yeah. is it? So for that thing, 
let me go here in settings okay and there is something called manage access okay. here i have to invite a collaborator so for example i can invite my id which is called 100 to the So this is how anyone who have access to that, he, he need to accept the invite. He should have a permission to merge those changes. Or if you have the, like most of the cases where I see, most of the companies have the organization. So organization will have like, for example, in the organization, you have the bunch of reports and the reports have the org admin who have the permission to merge those changes. So either your collaborator, has the admin permission to merge those changes, or either you have the repo admin or the org admin who can merge those changes. Is that answer And uh, Prashant, one more question. So right now, uh, the remote is uh, two commits higher than the local, right? So right yes. now, if we tr if we try to push from the local, it would reject the changes, right? Right now, if we try to push, yes, yes. So sure. how how do you how do you tackle that scenario? So in this that case, you have two options. First one is called git pull. So what git pull is going to do, it's going to bring those changes which is present on the master, on the remote master to your local branch. So here you see that we have pulled all those changes back to our local. These changes are something called modifying this file. Okay. So now you have raised an important point. So let me ask you guys this question. Anyone who is aware of Git, there's two things, Git pull versus Git merge. What exactly is the difference between these two? What is the difference between a Git pull and a Git merge? I think this is one of the famous interview questions, so I just want to highlight that. I will pause for 30 seconds and wait for you guys to reply this. I think git pull will just uh, pull the logs of the commits and merge will merge the actual files. Uh, no. I so, think uh, uh, git pull is a uh, git, it fetches the file and merges it, while git merge is uh, only, will only merge. And yeah, git pull I is a clone? Yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead, good. Git pull is not exactly a clone, but Santosh has the right answer. Uh, Git pull is a combination of something called a fetch plus merge, whereas Git fetch, what, okay, let me show you what exactly Git fetch will do. So you have already seen that when we perform this Git pull, it will bring all the changes which we have done to the master back to our local branches. Okay, now, Let's go back here. This one the one which I use. So let's this time let's make changes to the map first file. Right? Okay. Let's edit this. Okay. I'm not worried about this. Okay. So this time rather than performing the git pull, let's do git fetch. Okay, and if I am going to open that first file, is I did I get what get those changes? Yes, no. Let me show you one more time. I have added this line, right? New changes. Now I have performed git fetch. Did I get those changes? No, no, right. no, I don't. No, I don't think so. We'll have so to merge the files as well. Yes. So if you do git lg, you will see something like this. Uh, and there's something called history. So here you see that. One minute ago, I used a commit called update first file and I have made those changes, right? So, but if you run the git lg, you will see that, okay, yes, we have updated this first file, 
and we have that change. So at this stage, what exactly you need to do in case of get git fetch, and this is again based on like environment to environment. Most of the people they don't want to pull those changes. They first want to see what exactly those changes are, and then only they are going to merge those changes into their repo. Okay. So what exactly I need to do? I need to do same thing which I have done earlier. I need to git check out to this particular commit. Okay. I'm just seeing that now. If I do this and do git plus file, I will see. Okay, these changes are here. Right. Most of the cases, I always create something called a new branch out of this. So let me say. And one more thing. Yes. Last time. Screen is frozen. Oh man. Just give me a few seconds. Able to browse the internet. Are you able to see it now? Or no. Still the project screen only. So oh, good check out. Where? Okay. I mean. I'm able to browse the internet and everything. I don't know if it's an issue with the broken machine or something. Prashant, can you unshare and share it again? Maybe that will work. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. I don't know if I'm going to refresh it. It's going to work or not. Are you guys able to see it now or still loading? We can see it. Uh, yes, we can able to. Okay, yeah, I mean, sorry about that. I don't know. It's an issue with the. It's an issue with the go to meeting on my internet. Okay, so what exactly I was trying to tell you guys in a case of a merge or in a case of a fetch, we have the this commit, okay, which is present on my. Origin master, and now I'm going to create a new branch out of it. Let's say test branch. Okay, this branch should have that change. First file. Okay, now I will go to my master, check out master, and once again I will do git merge, and this test branch. Okay, so what? Ever the Git pull is doing for us. That is, it is doing the fetch as well as the merge. In case of merge, you need to do this two-step process. Okay. 
So this might be your interview question, like what's the difference between a fetch and a merge? So uh, fetch and a pull, sorry. So pull is a combination of fetch and merge. Just in the interest of time, I will skip few of those topic and I will go to something which is critical in terms of interview. Okay. So, branch, okay, and click LG. We have this. So, let me create a new branch. And now we can use a shortcut hyphen B. What hyphen B will do? It's going to switch to a new branch. So last time, if you remember, we have done something called Git branch, and then we perform a Git checkout. So Git checkout hyphen B is a combination of both. It is going to create a new branch, as well as the same time, it's going to switch to that branch. Okay. And let's say, let me go back to master. Okay. Let me go back to the master, and let me run this command called Git LG. So let's say this last commit, which I have done, is one of the most important bug fixes we have. And we need that bug fix or that commit in my this branch too, that new branch that I have created. Okay. Once again, let me repeat. So this commit, which I have done, is part of one of the bug fix. And I have a branch, one more branch. And I need that merge, or I need only that particular commit. So let's say that. Uh, commit, like, let's say that branch has like 10 or 20 commits, but I only want that particular commit to be in this branch. So what exactly I need to do? Once again, I can go to that branch, which I've created new branch. And I do something called git cherry pick. And the commit name. Okay. And if you go here, you have that file. That's right. Not, don't worry about that. These we haven't discussed about it. But now you will see that new changes is being the part of this branch. So this is especially useful in the, these kind of a scenario when we just want to pick one commit out of everything. Any question related to that? Because this is, I think, I saw this question in one of the interview forum as well as this is really useful for your day-to-day -day, like, like uh, day-to-day work also, get cherry picked. Any question so related to cherry that? cherry pick is specifically, so spec, uh, it is specifically if we want to uh, uh, have a cha have changes of a specific uh, commit. So uh, what about yeah. like uh, if we wanna cherry pick, uh, uh, like if we wanna have information about two commits, so is there any mm -hmm. flexibility of doing? Yes, there's something called rebase interactive where you can uh, pick those two commit. But OK, let me see if we have time. I can discuss about the rebase also. I have a question. Suppose or, you have, which are the latest commit is there, right? This is a master mm -hmm. test branch and new branch. Suppose I wanted mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, I want the changes in the, my first branch. Like suppose you said, Bug, bug fixes are there, so I have a multiple branches are there. So master is mm -hmm. there. So once once we fix the uh, bug fix, then we push that one to master. So I want those yeah. changes into my existing uh, branches are there, right? Existing development branches. How I wanted to pull those changes to my existing uh, current branches, like here, my first branch. The same way you can do either a cherry fix or you can merge those changes to your. So ultimately, the branches, they are kind of a short lived. Your main aim that uh, your changes must need to be there. I mean, this is just I'm giving you one example if you want to pick those changes. But in most of the cases, you are going to merge all your changes to your master or your uh, pristine branch. So same way you can do the cherry pick or let me give you a command how to do that. You guys can read about it. It's called git rebase hyphen i interactive. This is an advanced level command where you can pull where you can pick multiple changes, you can squash your changes, or, okay, let, let me see. If I have time, I, I, I'm going to demo you guys the three ways out. Okay. Like oh, in which scenarios we should uh, opt for the uh, cherry pick? 
mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in other cases like uh, uh, like what is the difference like one time i had this like uh, some, uh, uh, one of my dev manager he told me to do cherry pick but at mm -hmm. that time i did not understand why he was asking me so just wanted to know like which scenarios we should offer cherry pick uh, if it is hot fix or uh, any other like if you can give few examples that would be helpful okay so just give me one minute let me uh, take one more scenario and then i will explain you cherry pick so give me one minute sure. okay sure. let me show you two two more two or three more commands which is important from interview point of view and then we will go back to the cherry pick one more time does that sound good yes yes please okay so one more important question is let me create a new file completely new file let's say and then i will go back to this cherry pick scenario and all those questions you guys have related to branches so let's say i have created a completely new file called index.html okay and i add that file so just one more let me see where i am right now it doesn't matter but okay uh, yeah it doesn't matter okay so i was working on one of the one important project and all of a sudden my boss comes in i'm just taking one more hypothetical scenario and he said okay whatever you are doing at this point of time just freeze and we need to fix one important critical production work okay so i have two things I, if i have that code written fully i can push that changes to my one of the branches or one thing i can do is something called a git stash which will say it can easily explain to you saved working directory index state on new branch that is it is saving my work so i don't want that whatever the half work or whatever the half code i have written i don't want to push it to any of the branch because i know i have my own ci cd system the moment i am going to push those changes it is going to trigger and it's going to perform a build break and then i will get a email from the other team so if whatever the half baked work i have done so far i want to save those changes i can do something called a git stash and let's say and one more thing i can show you if you perform the git lg right now the log you will see something of uh, this weird entry called prep stash is pointed to this vip on branch this 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 okay and let's take one step forward let's say i go to that different branch i fix the bug uh, that particular bug i did all those changes and after that i want to come back to whatever the work i was doing so there's a command called git stash pop which is going to bring back that work which i was doing earlier to my local area to my working directory okay now i can commit this work my idea you know this is a horrible commit message but I'm just doing it so this question i see like two or three times when i was when i was researching about what are the top 15 hit interview question is called a git stash so basically it is nothing you want to save whatever the work you are doing is that is clear i know we only have 11 minutes so i'm going to rush for it i will take the question after 9:30 but this part is clear right git stash okay the next important thing which i want to discuss is that okay i wrote this horrible commit message commit my earlier work which does not make any sense to anyone like what exactly i was doing what earlier work which i have saved so there is a command to uh, to modify your commit message which is called git commit hyphen hyphen amend i think it's hyphen hyphen or single hyphen yeah it's amend so here i can even modify my commit message my earlier work for the dev environment i can say and this is going to perform a new commit see so i know this is not a good commit message but at least this commit amend only work for the most recent commit the last commit which i have done so if you want to modify the uh, commit message for the last commit you have performed this is the way you can do it with the help of git commit amend 
ओके एनी क्वेश्चन सो फार सो जस्ट रिमेम्बर दीज टू कमांड वन इज कॉल्ड किट स्टैश टू स्टैश योर वर्क एंड सेकेंड वन इज कमिट अमेंड टू अमेंड योर लास्ट कमेंट ओके आई एम कमिंग बैक टू दैट चेरी पिक बट बिफोर दैट आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू शो यू टू और टू और थ्री मोर थिंग so let me get check out master and i want to show you one most important thing which is called git under the hood so if i need to skip other topic i can skip it but i want to show you that git under the hood stuff let me push this everything is up to date okay let's say i have performed this commit by mistake okay and this is already been pushed to the github or my local git repository which looks bad now i want to revert that commit how to do that so there are two things one is called git revert i think somebody asked this question earlier and there is something called git reset okay so because this is important for your for your daily work as well as interview point of view so there are two things one is called git revert and git reset I, and i see that there are some confusion like in which case to use git revert versus a git reset git revert is been useful when you push your changes to the github if you want to revert those changes then those cases git revert is helpful if you want to revert the changes which is been done locally to your environment which is not been pushed to the github then those cases git reset will be helpful so let me show you git revert this kind okay now it revert that change and if i do git push i think i have changed that git lg i don't know if i have to work let's do this one you know i have yeah get the first file now now i can push this so the advantage of using this is if you go to your git repo okay you will see the two commits here and if you go to the history you will see the updated first file as well as the revert of that exactly what you have done the up, exactly opposite of that so in case if you are dealing with a public repo then the git revert will be helpful okay now if you are dealing with your local repo then there is a command called git reset and git reset has three flavor one is called soft one is called mixed which is a default one and last one is called hard okay if let me show you the hard one because you will going to understand soft and mixed if you understand the hard part so let me do git reset hard and let me say i want to revert the last one sorry git reset what i am doing now hyphen hyphen hard so i want to revert the last commit okay or so whatever the changes i have done earlier i completely blow out those changes to my repo are you guys still with me you understand what exactly i am doing it here Yes. No. Can you explain one more time, Prashant? I am not getting. I am not okay. understanding. So, let me touch this file. Okay, touch uh, my reset file. Okay. Get add my reset file. Get commit hyphen m. My reset file. Okay. Let's say I push this file to my local dot git repo. and then i realize okay i know my street getting big and big so i reset i checked in this file now i need to revert this file 
and don't even like i don't want to talk to the rest of the world or don't need to inform the rest of the world that i am going to revert that file that i already reverted that file so what exactly i need to do is i need to do something called git reset okay and if you check here we have this file called my reset file git reset hyphen hyphen r head hyphen 1 so hyphen 1 means whatever the last change i have done to my repo this guy just reset it reset it in the sense just remove the content everything out of it now if i go here you will see that file is missing okay so this is the use of hard reset there are two things which is called soft reset the only difference between the git soft and the git hard and all the other one for example for git soft we have to do git soft and head let's say i want to this this is not going to completely blow out your project in this case you see that that reset file is gone right but in case of a soft reset it's going to leave that file in your staging area okay and in case of a mix it's going to it's going to blow away uh, commit but it's leave those file in your working directory so if you see here it's completely removed the file my reset file so let me tell you guys in case of a soft reset it's going to leave your file in the staging area so in staging area you can perform git commit and check in those file back in case of a mix it's going to leave your file in your working directory and then you need to perform git add and git commit in case of hard it's completely gone gone from your environment okay now i realize that whatever the file that i have reset or i have performed the hard reset i might need that okay is there any way to retrieve that file back this is a question for you guys i will wait for 30 seconds so the file which i was working my reset file let's say that some code which i have wrote and that file is now i have removed it with the help of git reset hard so that that file is gone is there any way to retrieve that file back can you can use the revert, revert that commit id maybe but this is like a hard reset so that is gone okay okay exactly so there is a command called git ref log so in that git ref log i can see the commit id and this is the question someone asked me to next back what is the use of cherry pick so i can get this id and i can perform cherry pick for that particular in case if i have lost that commit and now that reset file is back but before setting up any wrong expectation a uh, ref log only only works for the same computer where you are doing that commit okay there is no garbage collection so git under the hood anyone who is aware of java git under the hood or any of the any of the language under the hood perform a garbage collection on the computer if that garbage collection performs your file is gone and that file should not be deleted for the last 30 days so if you are coming back to that file on 31 day that file will be gone so git by default under the hood take um, keep reference of all those files okay so ref log only works on the on the particular computer so i know it's 9:30 but i just want to show you one last thing and then we will wrap up the session which is i think it's important so for that purpose let me go back here and let me go back here also slash tmp and here so let me initialize a repo called uh, okay under the okay now i have this repo called git under the okay nothing is there only a directory called dot git so let me go inside the directory on the other terminal let me go git 
and right now we don't have a time so let's go to that object directory so right now we have this two directory called pack and info so let me run my watch command watch hyphen n dot one so that we refresh after every 30 seconds after every one second and we will see that we only have a pack and an info file okay now let me create a file with the content of hello world index.html nothing right because we haven't commit any change to the git repo and right now i'm inside dot git folder let me show you right now i'm inside git under the hood dot git slash object folder okay. and i have created this file called index.html let me add that file right to my staging area okay it created one commit called 3b let me commit this file to my local git repo my first commit two more objects created right ff and 2d let's try to look at these objects So earlier we have this, right? We have created, we have committed those files, which created two more objects, 2D, 3B, FM. Let's try to look at these objects, okay? So for that purpose, we have something called a plumbing command or a git under the hood command, which is called, uh, let me clean the screen, run this, which is called git cat hyphen file. And just a disclaimer, you might not need to remember or you might not ever going to use this command. This is just for special purpose when you are dealing with some special cases. So let me run this command, git cat hyphen file hyphen p and the sha1 hash, this one, 2d and any two digit is fine, 2d9. This one and again, this one. One second, one eight. FF. Okay, so let me run those three again. FF. Okay, let's try to read these commits one by one. Okay, so first thing, let's focus on these three commits which we have done. First one is 3B18. 3B18 is nothing but a hello world, the actual content of a file. And just remember, Git uses something called blob, which is called binary large object file. Binary large object, which means it only knows about the content of a file. It does not matter what exactly will be the file name. So file name can be index.html or prashant.html. It doesn't matter. It's only going to calculate the SHA-1 based on the whatever be the concept content of the file okay the second one is called a metadata where it know for example anyone who is aware of linux we know that this is a file permission so 644 is a blob object it has this sha1 hash which is like a 40 character long so if you do echo uh, And just remember that echo insert a new line character. So it should be 41, but it is exactly a 40. So it's a 40 character SHA-1 hash. So basically you can think this is like a metadata. And the last one is a commit hash. Last one is a commit hash, which is a combination of, for example, the commit message that I have provided, who is the user, which is this guy, and the email ID, the first two things which I have told you guys, the username and, a, and the email ID that we need to pass to the git command, at what time it has performed the commit. Okay, so if two people, if they are going to, there is something called, there is very, very interesting article where they said that there is no way to do a SHA-1 hash collision, but there is one guy in Google who did the, perform the SHA-1 hash 
Shah and Hash collision. Uh, so if you guys are interested, just read that article. So I know this is a little bit confusing and you might not need to run this command in future, but just aware of this, these three commands. Now, just to make the situation a little bit easier to understand to you guys, let me create one more file and it should have exactly the same content. Hello world. And let me create something called prashant.html. Remember, Git is a blob store. It does not matter to give Git what exactly is the file name. Okay, it's only going to create a SHA-1 based on this content inside the file. So let me create this file once again. Uh, okay, let me go here. Object, LSLTR, watch hyphen n dot one hyphen d and ls hyphen ltr okay now how many of you guys think whenever i'm going to perform this git add and the git commit so last time we see that when we perform that git add and git commit of that index.html the three shavan hash will be created now if the same file with the same content how many shavan hash will be created when i'm going to perform this git add dot and git commit hyphen m adding for sham How many Shavan hash will be created? I know we are out of time, but just a quick reply for any one of you guys. Are you guys with me? Yes, no. Okay, so in the interest of the time, we only it's only going to create two more Shavan hash, which is C3 and 3D. So let's see what exactly in that. So this C3, I'm again going to run cat hyphen file hyphen T, C3 and AC and FF46. So let me show you. No, this does not look correct. One second. Did I put the wrong commit? Ls hyphen ltr. So get get hyphen file ff. Oh, I forgot the name of the commit. Okay, something weird is going on. Thirty-eight. Okay. okay. Uh, does anyone else see the lag in the output of the string? For me, no. I'm seeing a lot of lags. I don't know. This is the correct file. Sorry, I'm, I was looking at the wrong hash. Okay, so one main point I was trying to drive it from here. If you are going to commit the exactly same file with exactly same content, you're only going to get two more new objects. And that is one of the advantage of using Git over other version control system. Git under the hood using something called a pack file. So right now, if you do not understand the pack file, pack file, you can think it like a tar file. So if you have a multiple files and you want to compress all those files into a single zip format or not use tar or a zip, the way Git will do it, it's going to create a reference. So in any way in the directory, if it's having a file with exactly the same content, Git is going to uh, uh, refer that file only one time. And this is the way it's going to save space for you. So just based on my experience, we have migrated one of the projects from SVN to Git, and we have seen a 10% decrease in space. So 
sorry, 10% out of the regular space. So for example, if the project size in SPN is 1 GB, in Git, it's only 100 MB. And that's what Git do under the hood. It uses a pack file really intelligently to compress all those files. Okay. And there is a question which has been asked, and I think I have a big fight with one of the other team members. So Git is not developed for the purpose of storing any JPEG or any of the like a like a movie file or something something all all those sort of files, because your compression algorithm is not smart enough to store all those JPEG files. So I know those guys they want to store their Docker file. Not exactly a Docker file, but the Docker container inside the Git repository. And anyone who is using Git, you know that in case of a Git, the default limit of storing the file is 100 MB. And I mean, storing a file is one different picture or a different story, but we need to take a backup of that Git. Okay. And if we start storing all those Docker containers or all those files, which Git is not smart enough to, to compress those files, then my backup time will be increased. So Git is specifically designed for the purpose of storing all those your code data. It is not stored to store all your binary data or all those JPEG files or all the movies files. So just want to emphasize that point before wrapping up the today's session. But you might not need to remember these command or you might never ever going to use this command called plumbing file or this one. Uh, I have one use case where I need to debug it with one of the developers. And that way I came to know about all these under the hood command. There are a bunch of command. There's already one session. And I think in one of my company, there's one hackathon in which one of the guy who developed a complete Git system without even using a Git command because all these are the Shaha issues. Okay. So I'm sorry guys. I know it's 13 minutes up. So before we are going to wrap up the today's session, any last minute question? Oh, Prashant, this one. Uh, what was that one under... thing, uh, Prashant? Sorry, can you? Uh,